On behalf of the Crop Trust and the CGIAR Gene Bank Initiative, thank you for joining today's GROW webinar. Before we begin, please note that comments or questions for the presenter can be placed in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens. Should our Zoom connection fail, you will immediately receive a new email message. Please click on that link to rejoin the webinar. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Carol Baskin, is a biology and plant and soil sciences professor at the University of Kentucky. Her research interests are the classification and evolutionary origins and relations of the various types of seed dormancy. She studies the germination ecology and ecophysiology of species from different habitats and biomes with different life cycles, life forms, and phylogenetic relationships. Carol has over 600 publications on the topic of seed dormancy and germination and has been the recipient of numerous awards. In 2012, she received the Tian Sham Award for contributions to the economic and social welfare of Xiangjiang, China. She has published two books. In 2014, she published Seeds, Ecology, Biogeography, and Evolution of Dormancy and Germination. And in 2022, she published Plant Regeneration from Seeds, A Global Warming Perspective, which comprehensively reviews the effects caused by climate change on plant regeneration, growth, and seed germination. The title of her talk today is Don't Let Seed Dormancy Be a Headache, How to Understand, Classify, and Overcome It. Welcome, Carol. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm happy to be able to share some information about seed dormancy and germination. I have been studying seeds for a long time. When we think about seed dormancy and germination, I think we should go back in history and realize that although we have problems today, we are not the first people to have problems with germinating seeds. The first people who tried to grow crops certainly had questions about seed dormancy and germination. We come forward in time to Theophrastus, the father of botany. And among his amazing contributions, he was very interested and made some really clever observations about seed dormancy and germination, including things like germination inhibitors and the effects of seed age and seed coats on seed dormancy and germination. I began my studies on seed dormancy and germination as a graduate student in 1966. So in some respects, I'm a, a, a newcomer to this business of seed dormancy and germination. One of the people who I have admired greatly um, is a Russian seed physiologist, biologist. She passed away several years ago, but her contribution to seed dormancy and germination is a, a lasting legacy. The document you see on the left, uh, the physiology of deep dormancy in seeds, is Dr. Nikolaeva's PhD dissertation. She received her PhD in 1967, and in 1969, this body of work was translated to English. The contribution she makes in this body of work and in her whole life's work is that she classified seed dormancy in the sense that she described um, five different kinds of seed dormancy, and those are listed here. And the word class is beside each of these. Physiological, morphological, morphophysiological, physical, and combinational dormancy. Actually, she included something called mechanical dormancy, but it has become clear 
that this is actually an aspect of physiological dormancy. Jerry Baskin and I took Dr. Nikolaeva's work and arranged it into a classification scheme. That is, we created classes and levels and types. And as we were doing this, it was our real privilege and honor to correspond with her via email because one of her grandsons spoke English and uh, would translate for us and we exchanged many emails, she agreed that mechanical should be a part of uh, physiological dormancy. Actually, for each of those classes of dormancy, I could probably lecture for over an hour. I don't think you want to hear that much about all of this. What I want to do today is take sort of a a hands-on approach. I want to share with you some of the ways I have dealt with seeds. In particular, if we want to germinate seeds that we don't know anything about, let's say a big bag of seeds arrived from Hawaii, how could I go about trying to germinate those seeds? First, the question I have learned to ask is, are the things in the bag, are these small objects really seeds? I have been fooled, particularly by things that look like the ones in the lower right-hand corner. I remember clearly spending a whole year on these things only to finally figure out there was nothing inside. They were empty. So some plants can make the outer covering, the pericarbon aceco, but there's no embryo or endosperm inside. So I long ago quickly learned to always cut a lot of seeds open and make sure, <laughs> excuse me, that, that I really had a, a true seed or a fruit. Also, excuse me, I have become aware that sometimes if seeds are collected a little bit on the green side, that they are very, very difficult to germinate. In fact, I have some gania from Hawaii that I finally just gave up on. I think they were picked when they were just a little bit immature. With these beautiful Sephora seeds from, <clears throat> from Texas, you can easily see that the seeds in the middle of the Petri dish, these are on wet sand, have imbibed water, but I scarified these. So in some cases, it's very easy to tell if the seeds imbibe water or not, and it's easy to see the effects of mechanical scarification. The very best way to make sure that the seeds are imbibing is to weigh the seeds. Very seldom do you have such a striking illustration that the seeds have imbibed water. Another thing I have learned is that in some cases, for example, Boraginaceae, Laniaceae, it may take several days, even weeks, for the seeds to become fully imbibed. When dealing with seeds that potentially are water impermeable, this, this is really an easy problem to solve. First of all, we have a list of families in which these water impermeable seed coats, or sometimes it's the fruit coat, occur. So if we're trying to work with seeds that belong to any of these families, a good thing to do is to check to make sure they imbibe. The problem is not all members of all of these families are impermeable. Some of them are permeable. Some actually have non-dormant seeds or they might even have 
physiological normal sleep. So if, if you have seen that our water impermeable, it's so this is called physical dormancy. These seeds cannot be recalcitrant because in order for the seed to actually become impermeable, they must dry down to five or 10%. These seeds, and sometimes it is the fruit, uh, have a palisade layer of cells that impermeable to water. So if we mechanically or use some kind of treatment to make the seed coat uh, permeable, the seeds imbibe water and germinate very quickly. In the natural world, the seeds have a structure on the seed coat, or it could be the fruit coat. And under certain environmental conditions, this structure moves or opens and this is how water gets into the seed. And here in the lower corner, we see a, a morning glory seed, of Ipomea. And you can see that it actually has two water gaps and the little black areas behind are the areas where the water enters the seed. To deal with uh, these seeds, Sometimes they respond to wet heat. We can dip them in the boiling water for a few seconds or dry heat, but sometimes neither one works. In that case, we might try acid. My preference is to use a, a razor blade and to cut a small hole in the seeds. Another question to ask is, do the seeds have a small embryo in relation to the size of the, of the seed. Here we see some drawings of seeds. The white is endosperm, the black is embryo. And what has to happen with these seeds is that after they are planted, after they're placed on a moist substrate, the embryo grows and it becomes large enough to occupy the whole space inside the seed. So in these species, the dormancy period is actually just the time required for the embryo to grow. So with these, you might not even realize they had a small embryo and the embryo was growing because if you plant them, they germinate in, in a relatively few days. The only problem might be that it could be a species that required dark, or in some cases they require light, so it's good to put them in both light and dark. Now we come to physiological dormancy, and this is where the headache begins. This is the class of dormancy that is the most diverse and it is the most uh, complicated. And let me just give you some facts about it and then we'll get into what to do about all of this. These seeds readily imbibe water. They have a fully developed embryo that is a nice large embryo. You can see the, the structures. If we plant these seeds, it takes longer than 30 days for them to germinate. And the problem with these is that the embryo, the embryo has a physiological inhibiting mechanism. This is the term that Nikolaeva gave this problem. And I think it's still a very useful um, term. This physiological inhibiting mechanism results in the embryo having low growth potential. This means the embryo is kind of weak. It does not have the strength to break open the seed coat or the fruit coat or the endosperm, all of those structures that can be around the embryo. In nature, these seeds 
must receive a treatment. And this can be a warm, moist treatment of about 15 degrees Celsius or higher. It can be a cold, moist treatment. Um, if it's cold, we call it cold stratification. If it's warm, we call it warm stratification. Some seeds need warm, some need cold, and some need both. These treatments increase the growth potential of the embryo and allow it to have enough power to break open the seed coat. So from a world perspective, uh, in this diagram, we see the vegetation zones of the earth beginning with a tropical rainforest and we end here with the tundra. No matter where you go on earth, the most common kind of seed dormancy that we find is physiological dormancy. And if we ask what proportion of the dormant seeds in each of these vegetation zones has physiological dormancy, it ranges from about 50% in the tropical rainforest to about 75% in the montane zone here in the temperate zone. Last summer, I had the idea of what making a big table. Um, what kinds of dormancy do we find in the 435 families in just first? So I found the information for all but 47 of these families. 61% have physiological dormancy, 20.5% either have, have a small embryo, about 4% physical dormancy, and only a very few families have only uh, non-dormant seeds. Interestingly, in 151 of these families, both physiological dormancy and non-dormancy were present, and in that case, they were counted up here in the physical, physiological dormancy. So why is there so much physiological dormancy? When we consider physiological dormancy, we find that there are three levels, non-deep, intermediate, and deep. And when we consider non-deep, physiological dormancy, there are six different types. Dormancy break it may require warm or cold, or it might require both. Or dormancy break might just occur during dry storage. After the physiological dormancy is broken, many species have kind of particular temperature and light dark requirements for germination. And there are some species whose seeds, whose non-dormant seeds require special chemical stimulation, such as compounds from the host or smoke or ethylene. All of this together, I think, represents a fine tuning of species to various kinds of environments. Also, Physiological dormancy can be combined with other things. For example, physiological dormancy can be combined with physical dormancy. In that case, we have to break both kinds of dormancy if we're going to germinate the seeds. Just as an illustration of the two kinds, where I live here in Kentucky, we have species whose phys physical dormancy is broken in the summer, that is the water gap opens, and then cold stratification of winter is required to break the physiological dormancy of the embryo. Other species, such as some of our winter annuals, the physiological dormancy is broken during the summer, and this happens due to dry after ripening, and the 
water gaps open in the auto. Also, physiological dormancy can be combined with seeds that have the small embryos. And there are at least nine different kinds of um, morphophysiological dormancy. This is a, a table out of our book on seeds that was published in 2014. It shows the details of physiological dormancy. Regular means the root and the shoot come out at about the same time. Epicotyl means the root comes out and then there's a long delay before the shoot comes out. So with for today, I just want to go with the regular. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about non-deep, intermediate, and deep, and how we might try to deal with these three levels of physiological dormancy. I don't have the percentage, but I know that of all the dormancy in seeds on earth, the percentage of the possibility that we would be dealing with non-deep physiological dormancy is very, very high. If we excise the embryo, it'll grow. If we scarify the seed, it's likely to germinate. Gibralic acid will promote germination. But with these, the conditions required to break the physiological inhibiting mechanism in the embryo is usually, or quite often, different from the conditions required for germination. So with this in mind, when I get new seeds that friends send me, a question I ask is, where does the species grow? What kind of environment does the, do the seeds experience after they are dispersed from the mother plant? Let's deal with the temperate region first. There are two big groups of species in the temperate zone. One group seed dormancy break occurs in the summer and it might occur due to dry after ripening or it might actually occur during the alternate wetting and drying that occurs in the habitat. But under summer conditions, the seeds do not germinate even if they become non-dormant. Germination occurs in autumn when there's a slight decrease in temperature and the soil is moist. In Kentucky, we have many winter annuals and a few monocarpic and a few polycarpic perennials that do come out of dormancy during the summer and germinate in the autumn. In Mediterranean regions, there are many winter annuals and many monocarpic and polycarpic perennials that become non-dormant in the summer and germinate in autumn. Okay. Another big group of species in the temperate regions involves species whose seeds become non-dormant during the winter when it's cold and moist and they germinate as the temperatures begin to increase in the spring. Now let's consider the tropics. And remember, we're still talking about um, non-deep physiological dormancy. Here, there are two possibilities. There are zones of vegetation where it's basically hot or warm and wet all year. Here we may actually find several species whose seeds don't need any dormancy breaking. Uh, some of these might even be recalcitrant. 
There are, however, many species that have seeds with non-deep physiological dormancy, and these seeds pretty much slowly come out of dormancy. Dormancy break can last from, say, I'm working on a review paper with a Ruby ACE, and I find that dormancy break can last for maybe four to five weeks, maybe up to 30 or 40 weeks. And all of these seeds can be in the same seed lot. So there's great variation in the time required for dormancy break of the individuals in the same seed lot. What's going on here is that as the seeds become non-dormant, they go ahead and germinate. In some parts of the tropics, it's hot and warm all year, but there are distinct wet and dry seasons. So if there is a distinct dry season, it's likely that the dormancy break occurs in the dry season and germination is delayed uh, until the onset of the wet season. One more point about non-deep physiological dormancy. And that is quite a few species have been shown to undergo annual dormancy, non-dormancy cycling. With this old figure for Arabinopsis thaliana, the seeds were exposed to natural conditions, natural temperature, and you can see that dormancy break occurred uh, when it was hot, germination occurred in the autumn as temperatures were beginning to decrease. And if seeds were not exposed to light and therefore didn't germinate, they went back into dormancy. I want to refer back to dormancy cycling near the end of my lecture, but I wanted you to see how distinct uh, these cycles can be for at least some species with non-deep physiological dormancy. A second level of physiological dormancy is called intermediate. These seeds require long periods of cold stratification. If we excise the embryo, it'll grow, but gibberellic acid may or may not work. In the laboratory, germination it takes long periods of time, and I'll show you a figure here in a second. A point about this is, if it's intermediate, dormancy break and germination occur at the same, and in this case, it's low temperatures. The trick to these seeds is that a period of warm stratification or in some cases, dry storage may actually decrease how much cold stratification is required to break dormancy. To illustrate this, this is false mermaid, uh, Floerchia. Um, if we collect the seeds and put them at five degrees Celsius, which is a really good temperature to break dormancy and promote germination, Oh, to get 50% germination, it takes about 18, 19 weeks. But look what happens if we give just a few weeks of warm, stimulated summer conditions. We can actually decrease the time to 50% down to seven or eight weeks. So in nature, this species germinates in winter, the seeds mature by May. Uh, they go through a summer, which gives them a, a long period of warm stratification. And during the winter, they really don't need that much cold stratification. About 80 species have been identified as having intermediate physiological dormancy, and the families are listed here. 
Only about 20 of these have been studied in any detail. But here's the question that I don't know the answer to, and you may be in a position to have the material to investigate this question. Does intermediate physiological dormancy occur in subtropical and tropical regions? And if so, would a brief period of low temperatures reduce the length of the warm stratification period needed to break the dormancy? The third level is deep physiological dormancy. And for many, many decades, we only knew that this occurred in seeds that require long, I mean, really long periods of cold stratification, maybe three to six months. However, it has been discovered that in an ericaceous shrub in Hawaii, that long periods of warm stratification, four to 16 months, will break the dormancy. So how do we describe deep physiological dormancy? If we excise the embryos, they either don't grow or the plant is really strange, it's something kind of a dwarf called nanism. Gibberellic acid does not work. Dormancy break and germination occur at the same temperature. And for about 20 temperate species in the about four or five families, we know that they need these really super long periods of cold stratification. I know from experience that there's at least one species in the montane zone in Hawaii where the seeds have these characteristics, but they require up to 16 or more months of warm stratification for the seeds to germinate. Here's another question. Nay or own in, in 1991 and 92, published the results of a long-term germination phenology study on tropical trees in Malaysia. The seeds were collected, put in a shady place and kept moist. And members of these families required three to eight months before the first seeds germinated. So I think there's a possibility that there are many families in the tropics whose seeds have deep physiological dormancy and the only way to break their dormancy is an extended period of warm stratification. So at this point, I hope I have convinced you that physiological dormancy is very common it is highly variable and it can be a huge headache. So what to do about it? We should not just throw up our hands and go home. A long time ago, I had the problem of seeds from Kentucky, the Eastern United States, of do I start with a warm period or do I start with a cold stratification period? And I've always had the rule that all germination experiments had to start with fresh seeds. So if I start with warm and it really needed cold, then I have lost a year. So it occurred to me one day well, if you don't know which one to use, why not use both? So this led to the development of something that we have called the move along experiment. And it's basically two germination phenology studies. 
One is started at summer, then it moves to early autumn, late autumn, winter, early spring, late spring, summer, and so forth. The other one begins with winter, goes to early spring, late spring, summer, autumn, and so forth. So the controls for this experiment are seeds placed at winter and summer temperatures, and it turns out that early spring and late autumn have the same temperature, generally, and late spring and early autumn the same temperature. So if you have a limited number of seeds, you have limited space, you could put three reps of 50 seeds at one, two, three, four, five, six conditions, six times three is 18 and then times 50. And you can learn a tremendous amount about physiological dormancy. If the seeds are non dormant, they'll germinate right away at these temperatures. If they require cold, followed by the cold winter, followed by spring, they're gonna germinate here. If they are a winter annual and they require the summer followed by autumn, they're gonna germinate here. The third, many species with morphophysiological dormancy that require more than one season for the seeds to germinate. Here's a case in point. This is Erythronium trout lily. It has, the seeds have something called a level of physiological dormancy called non-deep complex. Seeds with non-deep complex require the warm of summer and the cold of winter, and they germinate the following spring. So here is a move along experiment only the move-alongs have been placed on the right instead of the left. So collect the seeds. At the time this was done, I didn't know what level they had. So start them at winter and start them at summer. So we start at winter, go to spring, no germination, late spring, nothing, summer, nothing, early autumn, and finally, in the second late winter, good germination. Look at this. Start in the summer, warm and wet, autumn, and then in the winter, germination. So it easily and quickly told me that the seeds needed to go through the summer, through the autumn, through the winter, and they would actually germinate at five degrees Celsius. In thinking about seeds that have been placed in long-term storage, and particularly seeds that have physiological dormant seed, I have long had a, a worry, a concern, and that concern stems back to the paper that I read a long time ago. This was about our podium, put a picture of us here, the fresh seeds were dormant, but after six months of dry storage, there was 95% germination. And for some reason, the authors of this paper just left seeds in dry storage and came back after a nine month period and found that germination had decreased 55%. I have often but, and these seeds were still viable. I have often wondered if something like this could happen for seeds in seed banks. So last December, there was a small paper in the Samara, and I'm sure you've seen this title, Low Germination After Seed Banking Due to Reinforced Dormancy Rather Than Seed Mortality. This raises some questions. 
during the dry storage, either in a laboratory or in the really strict conditions of official seed storage, are the seeds, some of them at least, with physiological dormancy, are they going into a deeper level of physiological dormancy? And if so, how can this dormancy be broken? So I'm hoping the people who wrote the little article in the Samara will follow up on this and, and try to figure out how this dormancy might be broken. Another possibility, another question is, are these seeds undergoing dormancy cycling during dry storage. There have been various reports that seeds can undergo dormancy cycling when they're stored in constant conditions. And if you're interested in this, look on page 87 in our seeds book. However, I'm not sure that all of those examples we've listed in our book are really cases of where the seeds were under really constant conditions. If you're working with seed banks, you, you actually have the possibility of testing this. Can seeds in long-term dry storage undergo dormancy cycling? Finally, If we have seeds that are not germinating, please do not throw them away. Keep moving them. Keep, just be patient. I've encouraged students in the lab to not be discouraged. In fact, it pays to think like a seed. What's going on in the habitat where this species grows? Is it a real advantage to the species to have the members of a seed cohort that germinate over a period of many, many months and maybe years? Also, I have moved seeds to other temperature regimes with often good success. Sometimes just drying, drying the seeds for a month or two and putting them back works. But overall, I find that just simply waiting can be very beneficial. And I have an example of that. These are results for pyrophyllum pyrodendrum, which is a, a species from Hawaii. The embryos and fresh seeds are about a half a millimeter and they grow to about three and a half before the seeds germinate. What you see here is actually a move along experiment, but it's been graphed. The move alongs are the open symbol and the controls are the dark closed symbols. And what you see here is Regardless of whether they were being moved or if they just stayed put, it was, oh, about 12 weeks before any significant germination began to occur. <laughs> Excuse me. It took about 12 weeks before the physiological dormancy was broken, which in turn allowed the embryo to grow and when the embryo grew, the seeds germinated. So had I stopped at four weeks or eight weeks or 12 weeks, I wouldn't have had very many seedlings. In this case, waiting for over a year resulted in, in very, very high germination percentages. So I just really, have trouble throwing away any seeds that are still viable. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And I would like to close by saying that I think 
people who work in with feed storage have the opportunity and also the real excitement and challenge of learning more about seeds, particularly those of physiological dormancy that people such as myself who have a laboratory with incubators and not good seed storage facilities, I, I cannot attempt to answer those questions. So with that, I thank you again, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Carol. That was wonderful. Um, it, it's very unexpected how, how many different categories you've been able to identify and then subcategories with that and then all the different factors. Um, I think most of us that <clears throat> have worked, excuse me, in gene banks um, do not have an idea uh, of how to tackle difficult, difficult genera and difficult species. And I think uh, this move along experiment that you're advocating and are sharing with us uh, will go a long ways into helping. So we have shared in the chat, if you've seen it, we've had shared, we have shared the three publications with uh, which Carol has has kindly requested us to to share with you. And if you click on the links, it'll take you directly into three other her publications. And one of them is the move along experiment. So if you've had issues with germination of different types of uh, accessions, and maybe they're a big mystery to you, you know they're alive because of maybe tetrazoleum tests, but you don't know how to germinate them, maybe this, this is a place to start. So um, thank you again very much for that, Carol. We have we have a number of questions. We have seven. So if you'll allow me, I'll just uh, try to, to read them off and maybe we can um, provide some, some, some answers. So from Jonas Nikas, uh, first of all, maybe perhaps you can tell us what recalcitrant seeds are for, for, for the audience that may not have a clear distinction or maybe definition for it. And his question in particular is, why are recalcitrant seeds excluded from physical dormancy, if indeed they are? They, they are excluded because recalcitrant seeds, if we dry them down to 20%, 15, 10, it varies with the species, uh, the seeds will die. So with physically dormant seeds, they don't become water impermeable until they've dried to 10 or 5%, which is below the point that would kill recalcitrant seeds. So there have been studies about how physically dormant seeds dry, how the water is lost through the hilum, and eventually uh, they, they become so dry that no extra excess water is lost, but as it dries, it, it, it can almost imagine it like a little ball and it gets smaller and smaller and suddenly as tight as it can be, no water can go in unless an opening is made. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, thank you. So from Mariana Macedo, some species germinate quickly under laboratory conditions and others take up to two months to germinate when under field conditions. Is it correct to say that these seeds have some kind of dormancy? Or can we say that it is only the environmental conditions that define this germination pattern? Well, I need to know a little bit more about this, but it sounds like um, if, if the laboratory tests have included a wide range of temperatures and maybe the field temperatures are not quite appropriate or maybe the soil is not staying moist long enough, um, you know, some seeds have to be imbibed for several days before they really respond, before they begin to initiate germination. And interestingly, the seeds with physical dormancy, they have these little water gaps. The water gaps are so tiny that the intake of water is really slow. So some people have described those seeds as having their own little rain gauges. And if they can't take a, if it doesn't stay wet long enough, they don't get enough water and they say, I'm waiting. 
this was not a big enough rain for me. Right. So it, it, it's it's pertaining to the actual physical conditions, the amount of rain, who knows, the, the soil type, the warmth. Yeah, it's it's a lot of a lot of conditions that might go into that discrepancy between laboratory and field. Okay. There From are a few seeds that need special chemicals. I don't know what the species this is talking about, but some species like I worked on a scopus that needed ethylene, it needed to be flooded, it needed the ethylene in the water. So sometimes there's some really special environmental conditions that are needed. Right. It sounds mm -hmm. like an interesting species. <laughs> <They were Yeah>. <laughs> species. <laughs> um, we have another question regarding uh, fungal contamination. So the question is the following, is keeping seeds for a number of weeks or months on wet substrate, is fungal contamination a problem? Are seeds transferred to new wet substrates periodically? Uh, do you wash them? And there's another comment on that same one. Do you need to wash them from time to time to reduce the fungal infection? Or how would you advise people to continue? You said up to 60, right? Weeks for one. How do you keep fungal contamination in check? Oh gosh, that has, I have worked, I, don't, I honestly don't know how many species I have worked on. Uh, but you know, relatively very few have been real major problems with fungi. Uh, if the fungi get too bad, I, I seal the dishes and throw the whole mess away and forget it. But for like the Iroquesa Eve from Hawaii, those seeds were on wet sand, and I don't recall any real problems with fungi. But some other species I have worked with and, and wanted to keep them a long time, occasionally a seed would become contaminated, so I might just take that one seed out and wash it and put it back in a different spot. If it gets too bad, I would wash all the seeds gently and put them on clean sand. So it, it has varied with the with the species. Okay. The first species I ever studied was diodium, which is a weed. The mm -hmm. seeds are slightly hairy, little trichomes. And after the first day to monitor germination, the dish was so covered with fungi, I couldn't even see the seed. And I said, no, I don't think I'm interested in this species any longer. So, anyway. <laughs> not important, not so much. <laughs> not important enough to, to for the headache as you talk about it. Yeah. So, lab might become contaminated. Right. So, I, I figured it was better not to even open the dishes and get rid of, get rid of them. But that's absolutely the worst problem. Yeah. And to be honest, when I've tried to use gibberellic acid. I think one of the functions of gibberellic acid is in my lab has been to promote the growth of fungi. I'm washing the Clorox and then using GA helps, but often when I've tried to use GA, I, I, I could not carry those experiments very long. It's right. something about the GA. I don't know if it promoted the leaching of carbohydrates from the seeds. I don't know what it was doing. My experience with GA has been it's a good way to grow fungi. Yeah. But the hypochlorite in a dilute solution, that can help to uh, help disinfect them. the seeds before you begin? Yes, that helps. But it's not necessarily always foolproof. Right. OK. Uh, we have another question. Actually, we. We now have 23 questions, so <laughs> so we're going to have to um, try to get through all of them. Uh, Carol said that we could stay here for a while answering all your questions, so we're willing, but we probably want to get through them. It seems, next one, it seems that temperature and moisture are the main environmental factors necessary for breaking the physiological dormancy. However, how important, if at all, would you say light intensity 
or the composition or, or daylight period are for breaking the dormancy. In other words, if it's not moisture and temperature, what about light or daylight? Never found any indication that light is involved. But there are some reports, I think, of salic seeds when the seeds are freshly matured and they have a little bit of dormancy, but not too much, that that light can be a factor. But in the overall maybe 500 species I've studied, I have not found that light really, a dormancy break would occur in light or dark. But germination might actually require light or it might actually require dark. It's a, you know, the, right. Okay. Um, from the next one, are there any species of gymnosperms with PY? Not that I know of. If you know of one, please tell me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Next one, Sapindus saponaria from subtropical regions show dormancy. Do you think it would be possible to break this dormancy by applying cold stratification? You know, it might be fun to give them two or three weeks and then give them a really long period of warm stratification. This, this is the kind of species that would be fun to investigate to see if there are tropical, subtropical species with intermediate PD. That would be interesting because you don't expect it having, if it's tropical or subtropical, you wouldn't expect it in their natural environment ever to have five degrees Celsius. So, I mean, why not test it, right? To see if maybe they do have. Maybe 10 would be better than five. Okay. Or maybe 15 better than five. Uh, so something gentle. Yeah, something gentle, but, but a definite downward shift in temperature and then back to the to nice warm stratification temperature. Good. I, it's one of those things that just seems logical that it should be there, but nobody's really looked for it. Right. So Norma Manrique from, from SIP, she says, amazing presentation. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> next one, have you ever worked with seeds in wetland ecosystems? And do you think most of them are recalcitrant seeds? I have worked with seeds from mud plants, uh, the species that grow after the water recedes in the, in the summer. And I have worked with Scurpus holiad, which is a federally endangered species in the US that only appears in pools of water in the exceptional year when we have really good late spring rains. And that species I discovered um, not recalcitrant, but required ethylene to germinate after they've been cold stratified. So there could be a lot more species that grow in wet places that need ethylene to, to really boost the germination. But they're not recalcitrant. You could right. So yeah, but do require special special conditions. Um, next one: Is there any difference in dormancy between cultivated and wild species? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, the difference is how strong the dormancy is. For example. Um, Physiological dormancy is genetically determined, but it can also be really modified by the condition under which the mother plant matures. So there is a, like a transgenerational plasticity. So often with our cultivated species, I think we have actively selected the ones that are, whose seeds are not so deeply dormant. So I think as far as I know, I'm, all of our cultivated crops would have non-deep physiological dormancy, but there, there can be variations within non-deep physiological dormancy. So, yes. Yeah, we, several of our centers um, 
conserve forages. And we find that they are quite complex, more complex than any, any other of the accessions that we conserve. So forages may be the ones that you say, you know, have some of these combinations that we need to work out, um, possibly with the move along experiment. So with grasses, the whole family Poaceae, to my mm -hmm. knowledge, is just non-deep physiological dormancy. But some things like gamma grass, we grow this in our garden and watch the birds try to eat it. But it has a really tough outer coat, so um, I'm not quite sure how that's broken in nature, but I'm, I'm thinking it probably takes more than one year. Right. Uh, and yep. warm stratification all of the coat would be helpful there. We have um, a question, which I'll just answer. Will there be a link with the full webinar for the people who couldn't attend? Yes, we post it and the Crop Trust has a special uh, side um, website where it posts all its, web, uh, its webinars with the presentation and this recording. So you'll be able to see it and share it and, and, and view it if you wanna go over it again. And Carol's presentation will also be there. Um, Thank you very much. I, I would like to ask if the seed, if the seed is still wet, whether they start becoming dormant or until they dry, they become dormant. So when exactly, um, if, if the seed is wet, the fresh seed is wet, are they still dormant at that point or will they become, or are there species that become dormant once they dry? That is the, the question I think this, this person is trying to uh, ask. Oh, this varies with the species. Um, in chapter two of our book, we tried to, I, I tried to evaluate all of this. For some species, uh, dormancy doesn't really develop until they dry. So if you get the seeds and keep them wet, you might avoid some of the dormancy. That's certainly true with orchid seeds and with some of these seeds that have morphophysiological dormancy. If you green pot them, you can kind of bypass some of the physiological dormancy. But other species, it seems that they do, uh, they can become physiologically dormant at fairly high moisture levels. So, okay. Uh, again, I, I would, it's the case where you just need to experiment with the species that, that you're working with. Right. This one, this one is quite, quite similar. Um, she has a question about rehydration effects in seeds. If an imbibed seed is dried, would it damage the germplas the germination process? And why does it sometimes help the seeds to germinate? I'm not quite sure I followed that question. Or does she mean, ask me again, I don't okay. know. Okay, um, she, she has a question on rehydration effects in seeds. Uh -huh. if, if an imbibed seed is dried, okay. would it damage the germination process in some cases? Yes. In other words, would it stop that process? And why does it sometimes the drying help the seeds to germinate. I think I think that that's, okay. that's what the question is, yeah. I think this depends on the species. Some okay. seeds are very sensitive. If they dry even a little, it's probably not gonna be good for them. But you know, it's how Goodman in Israel uh, did a grass and I forget which species it was, but he found that the radisal could be out, the root could be out and he could still dry them and they would still be okay. So I think there's a big range of variation in how tolerant species are to, to dry. Um, also, I have found that if there's too much water in the Petri dishes, it can inhibit germination. So okay. I can mm. towel and dry it out a bit is mm. actually better than too much water. So there's a possibility it has something to do with oxygen. In fact, there's some seeds that have mucilage, and if you keep the seed wet, it, it, it never comes out of dormancy. But if you wet and dry it or keep it dry, it will come out of dormancy. So again, it's a case-by-case -case situation, and you just need to figure out the code 
to get it to germinate, all right? This is a question about bitter gourd. Uh, we have experience with seeds from bitter gourd that fail to germinate after dry storage in the freezer. Uh -huh. However, we could bring them to germinate when we place the dry seeds for a short moment at a high temperature. It was pos Is it possible to cycle by alternating very cold and very hot treatments? And what type of dormancy is this then? You mentioned it, the cycling, right? That it could you could cycle. So it was possible to cycle or is it possible to cycle by alternating cold and warm conditions? And what type of dormancy then would this fall under? I, I, as far as I know, bitter gourd is just 90 physiological dormancy. I think they imbibe quite well. Um, I have played around with high temperatures alternating with ice water and found it to be helpful, particularly with some species that are water impermeable. It helps to open the, the water gaps. And there are some species that if you give them a heat treatment, it promotes germination. Yeah, it, it makes sense about the bitter gourd, but I really can't explain what's going on. So I think in that case, I would do some experiments with different temperatures, ice water, 10 degree water, 15 degree, and so forth. It sounds like, um, um, I know a solanum from Hawaii um, has a terrible time germinating it. After a long period of moist incubation, I put them out and let them dry for a month, and it really improved germination. So it, it's hard to know sometimes how, how high temperatures or drying might uh, be beneficial. I, I mm. really I can't answer it. I, yeah, that's a, that's a difficult one. Yeah. It's reasonable, but I don't know why it would, why it would work. What, whether it's making the seed coat softer, it's hard to say. Yeah, Here, here's that. We're getting to the bottom of the list and maybe some of them we might, uh, are, are starting to be a little bit uh, similar to the ones we've addressed. So we might, we might wanna skip those. But this one is an interesting one about rice. I'm working with Ariza Barthi uh, dormancy and remarked that this species seed that I am using can germinate only when I heat it under 50 degrees Celsius for more than 30 days. Is there any chance to reduce this procedure without dehauling the seed? That sounds like a case of dry after ripening. You know, from, have they tried gibberellic acid? Okay, so gibberellic acid might be something that they can do, yeah. It sounds like the embryo is just too weak to break through the holes. And okay. after ripening might be might be what's going on there. This one is a quick one about possible fungicide. Uh Ben Late okay. would if it's used, would it inhibit germination as a possible control for, for fungal infections? I honestly don't know. <laughs> okay, that would be need to be tested, right? Yeah. I single days. My husband, Jerry Maskin, who also was into seed germination, was using a, a fungicide, and he found that it inhibited, but I have forgotten what that fungicide was. So I, I would check it to be sure. You're right. Okay. And I think... Um, Let's let's this this can be our last one, I believe. All the other ones in some form or another, they're either in her presentation, uh, Carol's presentation, or have been already um, discussed. But this can can you say a little bit more about this dormancy cycling under constant conditions? You mentioned it that it goes, you know, and then it cycles. So maybe if we keep seeds for 15, 20, 25, 30, 40 years under uh, minus 20 or under four degrees Celsius, those are our two conditions that we keep them under. Can you say a little bit more about this cycling? H have you noticed how, how long it takes before it cycles back? You know, exactly 
if it, is it, if, does it vary between species or how, how would you want to tackle this if you are a gene bank manager and uh, you know a little bit about the, the potential cycling of dormancy? I probably know enough about this to confuse you, but this was first reported by Itzhak Guterman in Israel. He, he had seeds of Mesembryanthemum that he had stored, I think, in paper bags in his office. And his daughter needed a science fair project. So he let her uh, test the seeds. And I can't remember. They were very different from when he had last tested them. So they, they began to test at intervals and found that at some times of the year, they germinated really well, and other times they were dormant. And they said the seeds were stored under constant conditions. But I know that Itzhak's office was not always perfectly air conditioned. I mean, there were some small, subtle seasonal differences in, in his office. Also, I know a case in China where people put the seeds, the dry seeds, in a room. But again, there are these small variations in seasonal temperatures and maybe relative humidities. But the seeds cycle. So, and there are various other people who reported, um, you know, seeds in rooms you know, in, in pretty constant but not absolutely constant conditions so in my mind it, it could be that the cycling is controlled by genetics it could it, there's a possibility but it, in all the studies i've looked at the conditions for storage were not really 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 constant but with mm -hmm. seed banks they are really really constant so you know, the people that did that study that came out in the Samara, I, I would encourage them to go back in six months and, and test some of those again, maybe at six month intervals and just see, right. yeah. you know, pick out a species that you've got tons of seeds for and, and just, just follow it. I mean, if it's cycling after six months, you should see some difference. Right. I mean, it could be that all of these reports about cycling and constant conditions, the seeds are sensing just small variations in temperature or relative humidities, and it's really not, you know, a continuous thing. Yeah. But it gave us an opportunity here to really address this question. Exactly. And, and I think gene banks would be an ideal place to do it because gene banks have two environments. They have the plus four uh, and it's constant relative humidity, constant temperature, constant light. And then they have the minus 20, which is the long-term storage. Again, constant. So you would be able to see if indeed there are you know, cyclings of, of the dormancy. And, and, and I kind of hypothesize that for some species, this might be possible because some species the seeds have been stored at minus 20 actually became less dormant. So there is a, an ability of seeds to respond slowly physiologically, even at minus 20. So certainly at four, I, I would think there's a possibility. Maybe, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I don't know. I just would really like to know. <laughs> yeah, definitely. More open questions. Well, I think you have now the official record of the most questions after a webinar. <laughs> We're up to 37. <laughs> so, but I think we're going to cut it. I think it's nine nine seventeen where I am. Uh, uh, so we're at the at the uh, time where we sadly have to say goodbye. But first of all, Carol, it was a pleasure to have had you on the grow today. There is huge interest in your field, as you can see. We had one hundred and forty uh, participants and many many questions uh, from people still on there. I would encourage you. Uh, maybe uh, if Carol is willing that you write to her directly, maybe with some of your questions, your hard questions. And uh, I think Carol has already said that, yes, she would be willing to receive your questions. So please do that. So a big thank you first to you 
Uh, our participants, as always, you've been great with your questions and your participation. We hope to see you in uh, in the next GROW webinar. Uh, and I'll leave the last last few words for you, Carol, if you would like to say something to our Gene Bank people. Oh, thank you so much for this opportunity. As you know, I've been working with seeds for a very long time, so I always enjoy talking about seeds to people who know something about seeds. So this has just been delightful. And going forward, I think you have the opportunity to make some new and exciting discoveries. And I look forward to reading about them. So take care. <laughs> thank you again. Thank you very much, Carol. And thank you to all of you. We'll see you in a couple of months. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.